from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, a crypto crackdown. China bans all crypto transactions. Yes, crypto trading and mining in China now illegal. Will other countries follow suit or seize an opportunity? We'll discuss. Plus, Huawei CFO, who's been on house arrest in Canada since 2018, Meng Wanzhou, strikes a deal with the U.S. Justice Department to resolve criminal charges against her. Could this breakthrough ease tensions between China, Canada, and the U.S.? Details this hour. And Peter Thiel, the man of mystery who's wielded his power to influence tech Trump and even gained the IRS to make billions tax-free, we talked to Bloomberg's Max Chafkin about his new book, The Contrarian, a look into Thiel's continuing power plays. Let's get straight to our top story. Beijing's campaign against crypto taking on new urgency. The People's Bank of China has deemed all crypto-related transactions illegal. It's also vowed to end mining and stop offshore exchanges from conducting business with Chinese citizens. This latest crackdown cements a shift in the balance of power away from one of the first countries to embrace cryptocurrencies. We'll be covering the story from all angles today, but first I want to see how investors reacted to this news. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow has all the details. Ed, what a rocky day. Yeah, it certainly gave investors pause for thought across all asset classes, but in equity markets, we struggled for direction on Thursday, but a late comeback did put us in the green. The S&P 500 up by just more than a tenth of a percent, hardly eking out a gain on Friday. And you can see some slight underperformance in the tech-heavy Nasdaq 100. But this really centered around cryptocurrencies, of course, and the Bloomberg Galaxy crypto, which is largely made up of Bitcoin and Ethereum, but other cryptocurrencies as well, did fall almost 7%. At one point, it had been down 11% Friday. Friday, its biggest drop since May, but did pair some of those losses. The other narrative in the market as well was about this just being the latest example of Chinese authorities targeting a particular industry. So you saw some of the biggest Chinese companies that are listed in the U.S. also fall. The Golden Dragon Index falling almost 3% on Friday. Questions raised by investors about what comes uh, next. But you put it best, Emily. It's been a wild week. So if we look at the S&P 500 alongside Bitcoin, remember, some of the drops we saw in cryptocurrencies Friday weren't even the biggest drops of the week. We started with such volatility at the beginning of this week. And as we've moved on, the S&P 500 is kind of normalized as investors think about the, uh, the Federal Reserve, the outlook for rates and the economy. But we've seen this outsized drop in cryptocurrency. It was interesting. At the beginning of the week, we started off risk off mode. Equities fell and Bitcoin fell. The end of the week, Bitcoin falls, but equities didn't follow suit. They stayed the course. And so there's some separation as investors kind of unpick everything that's going on in the world. Put this Bitcoin move in particular into context for us. I mean, we see a big drop on the day. You know, markets now reopened and slightly in the green at the moment. Yeah, exactly so. At one point, we were down more than 8%, almost 9%. But remember, volatility in Bitcoin is not rare. In fact, there have been 13 occasions over the last 12 months where Bitcoin has fallen by more than 8%, but then followed on with a weekly gain after that. So the, the market's kind of sanguine about it. Also, it's not the first time that China's had an influence. Think back to May, when China first started voicing concerns about cryptocurrencies. We saw this outside down, downward move. Nothing like we saw today, much more muted. And there are concerns, right? If you bring up some of the crypto-related stocks that fell on Friday, clearly this is giving investors jitters of what this means from a transactional point of view. But you can see, you know, MicroStrategy down 3%, Coinbase down 2.3%, Riot Blockchain down 5%. Investors across asset classes clearly taking notice. Emily. All right, Ed, thanks so much. We'll see you a bit later this hour. I want to continue to dig into this major story and bring in the head of institutional investing at the crypto exchange Falcon X, Aya Kantorovich. Aya, look, we know that China has been taking steps in this direction, but this is incredibly dramatic. I mean, what is your take on this? What does this mean for even a company like Falcon X? 
Sure. So, you know, I think China has been banning cryptocurrency for a number of years now. First in 2013, 2017. This is not the first time they've done so this year. And for an authoritarian regime that's trying to promote their digital one and keeping in mind that the China national holiday is next week, their crackdown on crypto is what I would really align with Senator Pat Toomey, a big opportunity for the United States and a reminder of our structural advantage over China. In terms of, you know, just what we've seen historically to what Ed mentioned, this definitely wasn't as large of a move as we've seen, uh, you know, prior times in market movements. We see a red candlestick down um, and panic initially, uh, followed by a quick buyback and market recovery uh, for BTC largely buy side, uh, led by Asia-based hedge funds and for U.S. Um, institutions across a number of personas. And for ETH, we're seeing a much larger hit with a much slower buyback uh, driven by proprietary funds. Who are the winners and losers here? And, and, and if you could get into some coins specifically, you know, that would certainly help us better understand the situation. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. You know, I think uh, what we were seeing, it was, you know, a slower last two months historically uh, for us on the volume side. We saw seven times more volume today um, than we had seen across, you know, a number of weeks where we had a lot of conferences, both in traditional finance and cryptocurrency. Uh, layer ones are definitely top of mind. I know uh, you have spoken, um, you know, about uh, layer ones historically in the past, you know, Ethereum, but also uh, things like Avalanche, Solana, uh, Atom, as well as Luna, um, in addition to Bitcoin, uh, and then some tokens outside of that, uh, primarily looking at uh, renewed interest in some of the play to earn tokens like a YGG or an Axie Infinity. And, you know, China is saying they're going to investigate anyone working for overseas cryptocurrency exchanges as well. Would any Falcon X employees fall under that umbrella? I mean, what does this mean for your employees and the way that you operate as a company? Yeah, so Falcon X today, uh, we do have offices uh, in the U.S. as well as our Asia office uh, in India, so uh, not a direct impact to our business, uh, but I think that's definitely top of mind for, for any business uh, that may have um, any employees sitting in, in China, as you mentioned. Now, if, you know, obviously this is happening in Asia, which, which, which used to be sort of the center of crypto innovation, we're preparing for tougher regulation here in the United States. We're preparing for tougher regulation on crypto in Europe. If that's the case and you see a broad-based crackdown, then where do you think the growth is going to come from? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, you know, if we use just China mining as an example of this, uh, we saw China ban mining and we actually saw a number of those miners come to the United States. So hash rate is almost 70% of what it was prior to the ban. So we've almost had a full comeback uh, from that. And a lot of the miners today are in the US. And so uh, we really saw that innovation come to the United States. And again, going back to that, really an opportunity for the US to show that we're at the forefront of working uh, with this industry uh, to spark innovation. Um, I think across the board, everyone's trying to protect consumers. That is top of mind for any company in this space. How do we do so without stifling innovation? All right. We're going to continue to cover this throughout the show. Aya Kantorovich, Falcon X head of institutional coverage. Aya, always appreciate you weighing in, and especially on a day like today. Thank you. Coming up. A major deal reached in the criminal case against Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou, who's been on house arrest in Canada for the last three years. We're going to bring you the latest, plus how this could ease tensions between China and the United States. Next. President Biden says most Americans with the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID vaccine will be able to get a booster shot six months after their second shot. That's after CDC Director Rochelle Walensky broadened eligibility for the shots beyond the recommendations of a CDC advisory panel. The decision of which booster shot to give, when to start the shot, and who will get them is left to the scientists and the doctors. That's what happened here. About 100 million people in the U.S. have been fully vaccinated with the Pfizer shot. Only 20 million are immediately eligible for a booster based on that six-month timeline. President Biden asked Americans who got the Moderna or J&J &J shots to 
be patient. Meantime, online searches for COVID tests are surging as more employers and large-scale events require testing. Google says the number of Americans looking up at-home COVID tests near me has doubled in the last month. And people asking how long rapid test results take, up 250%. In most states, users were more interested in searches related to tests rather than vaccines. Meantime, Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou and the U.S. Justice Department have reached a deal to resolve criminal charges against her. This three years on, Bloomberg has learned Meng is getting a deferred prosecution agreement. That means she'll plead not guilty, still to be determined whether she'll be allowed to go back to China. Bloomberg's Danielle Bukov here with us now to discuss. So, Danielle, what exactly happened today and where do we stand? Yeah, so we've got two things going on today. The first has already happened. The, the second is happening actually right now as, as we speak in a Vancouver courtroom. So a short while ago in the United States, uh, as you say, Mung reached an agreement with the Justice Department to end U.S. criminal charges. As part of that, the, the not guilty plea is a little bit misleading because she did admit to misleading an unidentified bank about Huawei's business operations uh, or dealings, rather, in Iran, which, of course, was the, the heart of the U.S. sort of case against her, um, was, was these allegations that she had, was in violation of uh, sanctions against Iran. The U.S. Justice Department, as part of that, agreed to this deferred prosecution, which is a little bit like probation until December 1st next year. As long as she's in compliance, they've said that they will dismiss the charges. And they've also said they'll ask Canadian authorities to release her because, of course, she has been under house arrest for two years in Canada. That's what's happening right now um, at a Vancouver courtroom. We're expecting any minute, really, to see that the extradition proceedings are going to be dropped against Hmong. Uh, our reporter, Natalie Obiko-Pearson, is right there as we speak. She said that there are pro Hmong supporters outside the courtroom chanting not guilty. Um, and, and as I say, we're expecting actually... The judge has signed, Natalie is just saying that the judge has signed an order of discharge so and is vacating the bail conditions. So my interpretation of that is that, yes, so she is free. So there you go. So Mung has been, um, the extradition proceedings against Mung have been dropped. This is obviously good news for her. She had faced as many as 30 years uh, in prison in the United States had she been convicted there and extradited from Canada. Good news for U.S. government prosecutors as well, who are very pleased that she has admitted misleading a bank about Huawei's business dealings in Iran. Okay. And it really, I, I just want to stress this, releases Canada from a bad position because the country here obviously has been squeezed kind of between China and the United States. The hope here, and I think this is going to be the next part of the story, is going to be that this will set the stage for China to have a deal to release two Canadians who were jailed in China literally days after Meng was arrested in what was widely seen as kind of a tit-for-tat move. Okay. So, Danielle, what do you think this means for the U.S.-China-Canada relationship? I, just about 30 seconds here, but do you see an easing of the tensions as a result? It, it will entirely depend uh, on what happens with Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig. They, they were, as I say, detained in what is widely seen in Canada as kind of a hostage-type move in retaliation for Meng's arrest. Um, China has repeatedly linked their cases. It's been a really huge story here. The conditions they've been kept in have not been good. There have been a lot of support coming from diplomats around the world. So, I, I mean, that that's the next story, what's going to happen to the two Michaels in Canada. But certainly, you know, it, it is going to be a huge uh, load off, I would think, Prime Minister Trudeau's plate if, if we're not caught in the middle of this this issue Certainly. Anymore. A fascinating turn of events. I mean, a C-suite executive at one of the biggest companies in China. Bloomberg's Danielle Bokov, thank you for that update. We'll stay tuned. Coming up, we're going to speak to the author of a new biography on the controversial venture capitalist Peter Thiel. Our very own Max Chafkin joins us to talk about Thiel and his new book. Plus, let's get a take on what to expect next week. Amazon announcing a slew of new devices and products at an event next Tuesday. Also that day, memory chip maker Micron will report fourth quarter results. And Friday, the Disney World theme park in Florida celebrates its 50th anniversary. This is Bloomberg.
the digital banking sector has experienced a transformation like no other. And as new technologies emerge, so too the need to protect and safeguard data. One company that helps organizations integrate data into business decisions and operations is Palantir. I spoke with the company's head of global commercial development, Ted Mabry, at a Bloomberg Live event earlier this week. We began by talking about what Palantir does with that data, given how sensitive it can be. We 100% only provide the software to our partners for them to be able to utilize the software to analyze the data that they have legal access to and control over. So we as Palantir as an institution control no data. We have no access to that data. We cannot utilize any data across institutions. We are only providing software to our customers for them to be able to use that data as well as enforce the controls that they need to enforce so that they can be compliant with how that data is utilized. Now, earlier this year, I spoke to your COO, Sham Shankar, and he talked about how the pandemic was really a shock to the system for companies, governments, your clients across the board. At this moment in time, has that shock been absorbed? What are companies and governments going through right now? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think you know, one of the things I think we're most proud of is that we were able to really help our partners during the pandemic. I think if you look at and ask them how many of their technology investments actually helped them evolve and adapt to that inherent volatility that was imposed by the shock, what we found was many of our customers essentially reverted to turning those software systems off, putting them on the shelf, saying we will return to those. And really in that moment, when the future sort of arrives, you'd expect that your technology would matter most. And I think we're proud to say that our technology did matter most. Now, as that has sort of worked its way through the system and evolved, I think what we're seeing is that people don't want to go back to how it was before the pandemic. And in fact, the pandemic is sort of realizing and revealing to them that that shock is the same shock that they're actually undergoing every single day. And so you have the macro events now, like major supply chain disruptions, uh, major geopolitical events that are reordering the dependencies across their value chains. But also, if you use the analogy of most software systems are helping them operate better in times of equilibrium, and then you had this moment in time that was a fundamental shock. How can I adapt to and treat that moment in time in its specific nature, meet it where it is? They're now saying, well, that same exact dynamic exists for me across the entirety of my operations every single day. How do I treat every single customer as an individual customer, not as an average across a, a BI report that says, this is what my tech customers tend to do? How do I treat every sing single situation when I'm optimizing the allocation of my scarce goods in my supply chain for those given customers in that given moment? And so kind of moving from we, if we can respond in the specific to a nuanced event in time, like the pandemic, I ought to be able to use software and data to respond to every single one of the decisions that I'm making every single day with that same specificity, that same resiliency, and that same adaptiveness to change. Palantir is Ted Mabry there speaking at the Bloomberg Live event, Banking on Digital, the Race to Transformation, earlier this week. You can catch that full interview at Bloomberg.com. I want to talk more about Palantir now with our own Max Chafkin, who is also the author of The Contrarian, a new biography of Palantir founder and chair Peter Thiel, who has also, of course, played a pivotal role in a string of Silicon Valley's most powerful companies from PayPal to Facebook. Max, there's so much uh, to talk about here, but you're going to have to give us the digest because we just heard uh, from a Palantir employee there. Talk to us about how Peter Thiel is wielding his power in Silicon Valley today from Palantir to Facebook to politics. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I, I just want to speak to a, a moment in that interview, which is really interesting, when uh, Ted Mabry mentioned, you know, the future arriving sooner. And that, that's super interesting, I think, both as an explanation of sort of why Palantir has thrived, which is what we just heard, but it's also a little window into, into Peter Thiel. You know, Thiel has been arguing for a very, very long time that, you know, that the apocalypse is coming, that there, there are going to be these big disruptions coming. And, and from that view, the, the pandemic was one of those disruptions. And of course, as we just heard, Palantir was ready. You know, it's, the, the COVID is very much a um, data problem, a problem of sort of making sense of say how many hospital beds are available, where's the spread going? And, and on top of that, because Teal 
uh, you know, back in 2020, had these connections with the Trump administration, had been able to kind of get Palantir in a room with Donald Trump early, I would argue they were able to capitalize that, that on that very quickly, signing a bunch of new contracts, you know, with HHS, with some of the organizations that were actually working on the pandemic response. Now, Peter Thiel, uh, much to most of liberal-leaning Silicon Valley's dismay, obviously supported President Trump and then became a sort of bridge between the tech industry and the former president. How, how has that played out for his relationships here? Did that, uh, you know, and where do those relationships stand? Yeah, well, you know, Palantir, um, you know, I, I, I discussed this in my book and, and talked to Palantir executives about this when I was reporting the book. And, you know, they insist, you know, up and down that the Teal's relationship with Donald Trump, you know, as you say, he was a key early supporter, a major donor, probably the most significant um, backer of Trump in Silicon Valley, that those played no role. This is all about the software improving. And it's true, the software is getting better. But Teal was also able to get Alex Karp, the CEO of Palantir, into a room with Donald Trump in December 2016, very early with, you know, all these other uh, uh, of executives of much larger companies. I think that likely played a role. And now what we're seeing, you know, post-2020 uh, post is Thiel is trying to carve out this new role for himself as a kind of patron to the, the Trump movement that, that goes beyond Trump. So he's supporting these you know, far right or, or, or sort of very populist nationalist candidates, uh, J.D. Vance, Blake Masters, who are running for the Senate uh, in primaries in Arizona and Ohio. And whether or not they win, I think there's a really good argument to be made that, that Peter Thiel is going to play a major role in kind of conservative politics going forward. And that role, of course, will have implications for Silicon Valley, because right now, um, you know, the Joe Biden administration is in power. Democrats control both houses of Congress. But, you know, that's not forever. You know, 2020, there's right. a very good... Sorry, go ahead. Well, you know, and also he is in the ear of Mark Zuckerberg, right? He is still on the board of Facebook. That is a key bridge for Facebook. Look, there's so many uh, things we could talk about here. Uh, in a nutshell, Max, we've got about a minute left. If we read your book, which is excellent, uh, and I have, what else will we learn about... Peter Thiel and how he's going to matter to Silicon Valley for the next 20 years. Yeah, I think we'll, I think what you what you'll get out, what I got out of it is that Thiel has just had this enormous ideological influence. I'm not talking about necessarily political ideology, although that's there. I think that his influence in terms of how companies are built, how Facebook in particular, as well as other companies in that kind of Thiel ecosystem are run, is very, very important. And we see it. We're going to see it playing out across Silicon Valley. You know, Facebook's been in a lot of trouble lately. Uh, you know, in controversy over over issues. Uh, you know, related to how they're treating users on Instagram. And I think, you know, those things are reflections of, of developments right. that played out in Teal's career and that we're going to continue to see playing out going forward. Well, I highly recommend it. It is indeed an excellent read. Bloomberg's Max Chaskin, thanks so much. Don't forget to check out his book, The Contrarian, available wherever you get your books. Coming up, Bitcoin and other digital tokens tumbling as China intensifies a sweeping regulatory crackdown on crypto. We'll get to that story next. This is Bloomberg. China has banned crypto close to eight or nine times now, I believe. But now it's directly prohibiting its citizens, which is certainly going to have a dampening effect on their ability to use cryptocurrencies uh, for any sort of transactions. It's an attempt to stem capital flight out of the country. Each time we've seen this challenge come up or a more prohibitive stance come up, we've seen truly the resiliency of the community around digital assets. And that exchange volume has moved to other geographies. Really highlights the strength of Bitcoin as a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer financial system. Ultimately, for blockchain-based uh, payments, that industry is going to do better, regulated in a sound way, rather than trying to be some kind of libertarian paradise. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. For more on the crypto ban in China, I want to bring back are Ed Ludlow, who's been tracking more of the fallout here. Ed, what are you looking at? Well, you heard it there. Resiliency, regulation. These aren't new themes for crypto investors. And you're seeing green on the screen behind me. Of course, we've spilled over into Friday's session. And, you know, investors have had time to digest the news out of China. You know, volatility 
is the key word. We were down almost 4% by the close of Friday session with Bitcoin. Now you can see we're higher by around two tenths of 1%. But come with me into my Bloomberg terminal and let's focus in on that volatility because price swings in either direction for Bitcoin are commonplace. You can see on the right hand side of your screen that, as I said, by Friday we were down almost 4%. That's within one standard deviation for Bitcoin. It is commonplace. It is something that we're used to talking about here on Bloomberg Television and the investors are used to dealing with. The problem is that you have to deal with the volatility in everyday use of cryptocurrencies as well. And earlier today, I spoke to Jared Isaacman, not just a space traveler, but of course, the CEO of fintech company Shift4 Payments. And he sets it out here. The reason that we're not seeing this as more commonplace, and one of the things that China was trying to clamp down on was volatility, its use in transactions. Imagine a slice of pizza, trying to pay for it in Bitcoin, the pizza being worth one amount on one day and a completely different amount the next. It's just not practical for the time being. And we saw some of that play out in the markets on Friday. It wasn't just the currencies falling themselves, but a broad ecosystem of companies that are supporting it. This is the Amplified Transformation Data ETF, a basket of everything from PayPal to blockchain companies. For those actual tracking from those companies investing in cryptocurrencies, you can see we snapped four straight days of games with a pretty sharp drop on Friday. And that was kind of what the market was taking on board. What does this China decision mean in the real world for companies that want to operate within cryptocurrencies on a transactional basis and also as a store of value? Emily. All right. Ed, thanks much. Well, while China's crackdown on crypto and companies uh, continues in response to this increased regulatory pressure, the crypto exchange FTX has officially moved its headquarters from Hong Kong to the Bahamas. The spokesperson uh, responded to the move saying, as jurisdictions roll out comprehensive crypto regulatory regimes, we are excited to take part. And in addition to this, we're prioritizing offices and jurisdictions without travel restrictions. For more on China's crackdown and the company's move, I want to bring in the CEO of the crypto exchange, FTX himself, Sam Bankman fried Sam, good to have you back with us. So I assume as an executive, this is kind of a nightmare. I mean, what's your reaction to this and how did you make the decision to move to the Bahamas of all the options out there? So, you know, I think that we've been looking at the Bahamas for a while. Um, they're one of the first uh, countries to roll out any comprehensive regulation for cryptocurrencies, which we think is extremely important for the space and, and a really positive sign. Uh, we are regulated uh, there by the Securities Commission um, and are excited to take part in that. Uh, it's also really important for us to be in a place where we can go on business trips, where there isn't quarantine. Um, this has been something which I think has been in the works for a while. Um, and, uh, uh, and and has been taking place for a while uh, and was not, not, I think, particularly in response to any very recent news. And China has said it is going after Chinese nationals. Anyone working for overseas cryptocurrency exchanges will be investigated according to the law. Are you at all nervous, you know, about yourself, about your employees who've been working for FTX now for some time? I don't think that this is as big of a change as many people are seeing it to be. That's not to say it won't have impact, and that's not to say that it isn't an update. Uh, but this is not the first time that we've heard statements that sound like this uh, coming out of China, you know, even this year. Um, it's probably not even the second time. Um, this is something that happens. Um, it generally is a signal of a further crackdown on some part of the industry. Time will tell what that part is. I would not be surprised if it looked at peer-to-peer -peer RMB to cryptocurrency markets, but frankly, could be looking at a lot of different angles. So, you know, I guess more broadly, what does this actually mean in your view for the industry? I mean, certainly this crackdown in China has been looming for a while, but we're also expecting some regulatory action in the United States, regulatory action in Europe. And if that happens, what does that mean for, for the industry more broadly and where the growth and the opportunity and the promise is going to come from? I mean, it's going to really depend on exactly what form it takes. And I think that what I'm optimistic for is that there is going to be new regulation coming out for the industry that will help to ensure that there's consumer protection, that there's transparency, um, that, uh, that it is a you know industry with oversight, but that in doing so, it will make it a stronger industry and it will actually make it um, you know uh, a place that can grow with more institutional involvement. Um, and and, and I, I'm, I'm optimistic that that's where the world will end up. Obviously, there is a risk that it takes a different direction and that instead you see uh, you know, regulation coming out that effectively uh, you know, shuts down uh, large swaths of the sector. Um, 
I, I, I think that it would surprise me if that happened in a sort of coordinated way across the globe, uh, but it's always a possibility. Did you have a sense this increased pressure was coming from China? Did you get any signals or uh, anything from authorities? I don't think we had a sense that anything was coming, you know, today in particular. I think there are always rumblings coming out about various actions, but I, it's hard to know when something uh, really specific or big is going to happen. I, I think we heard rumors of this, you know, probably happening a little bit before it, it hit the, the uh, airwaves. But, um, but I, I think that mostly this was not something that, that the industry was anticipating to happen today. Meantime, last time you and I spoke, it was about happier news. You had brought on Steph Curry as an advisor along with Tom Brady. I got to speak to Steph Curry a couple of days later. He said he's excited about FTX and excited about the possibility of crypto to open up economic opportunities uh, for underrepresented communities. Talk to us about your work with the two of them so far and how a celebrity endorsement like that can really make a difference. Yeah, we've partnered on a few things. Obviously, you know, we've um, had some conversations with them, taking part in some panels, um, you know, had an advertisement which involved uh, Tom Brady. Uh, but we've also been partnering with them on the charitable side um, and are excited to continue doing so to, you know, be supporting the foundations that are important to, uh, to all of us. Um, and I think that, you know, to sort of echo what Steph said, I think that, you know, when you look at unbanked or underbanked communities, um, getting access to a you know coherent set of financial rails that they can actually use to make payments is not very easy, and I think that crypto holds a lot of promise there. All right. Well, we'll certainly have to see how things play out. Sam Bankman Fried, FTX CEO, is now out of Hong Kong. Appreciate you taking the time to join us. Okay, coming up, we're going to be joined by Greylock partner Sarah Guo to find out how the Silicon Valley. Venture capital firm is taking a different approach to seed investing, and it involves a lot of money. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Greylock is doubling down on day one investments and has announced it's raised half a billion dollars dedicated to seed stage funding. The Silicon Valley venture capital firm says it is the largest pool of capital specifically for seed stage investing. Greylock partner Sarah Guo joins us now for more. So, Sarah, this is a lot of money for seed stage deals, which is typically smaller. Why do you want to make seed such a priority? So seed has always been a priority for us. Um, we've been active at this stage for a long time, and some of our biggest wins uh, historically have been incubations and seeds. So I think companies like Workday and Palo Alto Networks and more recently Abnormal and Snorkel. And then this year, 70% uh, of our investments, new investments were seeds before we announced this fund. And so when we saw this level of opportunity, we also we wanted to make sure we had enough funding to really back entrepreneurs and to support them through their journey and make sure entrepreneurs also know they have different options at the seed for the type of partners they work with. Now, at the seed stage, you're talking about companies in their infancy. How early are you investing? I mean, is this ideas on a napkin stage with a couple of um, entrepreneurs that you believe in or, or is it beyond that? Uh, so there definitely is a whole range. We don't catch every single person like the day they left their job, right? Um, but, you know, Abnormal was a seed in 2018 when it was a slide deck and two co-founders. Uh, we backed another company recently in stealth on uh, First Capital that was a repeat founder we have history with. Similarly, uh, you know, no product yet, just an idea and an early team. And, and so the range of when we do seed really depends on when we encounter companies. We do like to get to know people as early as possible. And sometimes that's the right time for us to write the check. Obviously, Greylock is a multi-stage venture, venture capital firm. And I think founders might have the question here, you know, if you give me the seed funding, will follow on and reserves come out of that same bucket? Um, and what could this mean in terms of a longer term relationship with Greylock? What's the answer to that? So the, the first thing I'd start with is seeds for us are core investments, right? So many firms look at them as options to then follow on. We look at seeds as investments we're trying to make money on. We're building a relationship for the long term to begin with, right? So, so I, I'd start with that. 
then I'd say it is a third of our fund. So it is a, um, a big piece of our investing. Uh, and, and uh, you know, there are many instances where we then follow on and invest even more because our conviction continues or even grows. But the point of us doing seed is not just to follow on, it's to make that investment. How big is each deal? I mean, would you say that seed is the new Series A? Um, I think, I think that, well, let, let's see, the market data would tell us that uh, round sizes overall have increased for the same level of progress. And I think that makes sense, right? Like, and, and the reason being um, the market has become a lot smarter at the attractiveness of early stage technology opportunities. Uh, and so, you know, great returns in tech venture capital over many years mean there's more capital than ever and people are savvier about software and internet companies. Uh, but I'd say there is, you know, I, I think kind of the nomenclature doesn't matter so much. We think of it as being the first institutional partner to, uh, to a set of founders. The world is changing quickly. I mean, we're still in the middle of a pandemic and who would have known that, you know, working from home was going to be a thing 18 months ago. What are the trends that you are most excited about right now that you're doubling down on at, at the seed stage? Yeah, so we invest across the technology spectrum, um, business, consumer. Uh, the one you just mentioned in terms of just the sea change of the pandemic in terms of how we do our work together is one I'm really excited about. But we've been we've been investing in, let's say, you know, just this, um, there's a shortage globally because of the pandemic, but even before of human connection and uh, and intimacy and people look for it online. And, and so we invest in companies like Discord and Common Room um, and Remotion that help people connect more online. So that's one we'll continue to invest in. And then of course, we're investing across all of your sort of usual range of, uh, you know, SaaS, social data, AI, et cetera, and then spending more and more time in fintech and crypto in particular. Now, one of the you know potential problems with seed stage is that at a certain point as the company develops, maybe they pivot, they change over time, they could potentially ultimately compete with another one of your core portfolio companies. How do you manage that? So it's a good question, but it is also something that doesn't only happen at the seed. And, and you know, funnily enough, Greylock uh, has been an investor in several companies that were like great companies post pivot, right? So like first investor in Discord and Nextdoor after they decided to be what they are today. Um, and so that, you know, I, I'd start with the premise of our, our philosophy is that the company should do what's best for the company. And uh, we, you know, our, our philosophy is to be fully behind companies and not to go invest in a bunch of competitors in a sector just because we like this sector. But if that were to happen, you know, we would we would just divide those interests within the firm um, and like make sure that there's no information flow and, and, and just address it in a reasonable way. I've talked with many of your partners over the years about investing in more women. And I'm curious how, you know, you look at seed as an opportunity to potentially, you know, spread the wealth a little bit across more women entrepreneurs, people of color, people who historically haven't gotten a chance in Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley hasn't benefited from their ideas. Okay, so I'd say this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, we are working on it. Um, two of the last three founders I backed are women. Uh, one is a seed stage founder. Uh, one of the founders I backed at the seed stage is uh, Hispanic. Uh, but um, but I, I would say, you know, one thing I want to make sure is clear, like we want to back great founders from diverse backgrounds across the spectrum. And like, we wouldn't like do it more in seed because seed isn't important because seed is important to us, right? It's just across the, the portfolio, this is a priority. All right, Sarah Gua, we'll keep following how you put the money to work. We'll have you back for a progress. Update. Thank you so much, Sarah Gua there from Greylock Partners. All right, coming up, civilian space travel. Jared Isaacman, the commander of the Inspiration4, joins us to talk about his historic flight last weekend, plus what the payment CEO has to say about the current state of crypto. That's next. This is Bloomberg. <music> Just one week ago, Jared Isaacman was orbiting the Earth at an altitude of 360 miles as the commander of the first all-civilian orbital SpaceX Inspiration4 mission. Now, 
He's back on Earth and back to his day job as the CEO of the fintech company Shift4 Payments. Our Ed Ludlow caught up with Isaacman to talk about his historic flight. People talk about the overview effect, looking back on Earth from, from such an interesting vantage point and, um, and the impact it has on you. And, and it had an impact to me um, because we were a little bit higher. Um, in fact, we went so high, there's probably less than you know, 25 people you know, in the world right now who've seen the world from, from that perspective. And what I saw was the space around Earth and, and the moon rise. And all it made me think about is we've got to get out there. We've got to go farther. We've got to satisfy that curiosity we have and, and explore the universe because we know so little about it. And there's probably some answers to questions we've all been thinking about for some time that are out there. We just have to find it. So the other mission here was to raise $200 million for St. Jude. You, you blew past that. But ultimately, you paid for this mission, right? You were the benefactor. How do we move beyond that? How do we move beyond space just being the domain of billionaires? Well, for sure, it's expensive, right? Um, that's why we have to make sure every mission has a profound impact on the world until costs come down to the point where everyone can go and explore among the stars. I mean, this is no different than, you know, Tesla Roadsters, you know, 15 years ago versus Elon announcing $25,000 Teslas uh, just recently or computers in the 1960s or cell phones in the 1980s, like costs will come down. But while they are expensive, we have an obligation to do a lot of good with it. That's why Inspiration4 did set out on this massive fundraising effort for St. Jude. That's why we have a very inspiring crew um, so that we could make a difference while, while we're in such a fortunate position to go to space. SpaceX were talking about how supply constrained they are, right? There's a backlog of willing paying customers, they say. What sense did you get from SpaceX that this type of mission, civilian orbit, will ramp up going into next year? Well, I, what I think is going to happen is um, I think with SpaceX pioneering uh, reusable rocket technology and driving down costs to make space more accessible is that there's going to be more people working in space. So I, I, I think uh, working, exploring, I don't know if you're going to have too many people uh, you know, going on essentially sightseeing chip, uh, trips. Um, but I do think as it costs less and less to put mass in orbit, we're going to be creating infrastructure in space and, and people are going to be working there. During our mission, we had 14 people in orbit at one time. It was the most in history of, of human spaceflight. A year, two years from now, it could be 140 and then some. So you guys were having a nice time up there, of course. You had some excellent views, but you were also conducting scientific experiments, other kinds of uh, study on the human body, human physiology. Were those tests real? I mean, did they give any real meaningful data to SpaceX or to NASA or anyone else? Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, NASA was listening in on all of our communication loops. You know, there was a NASA WB-57 high altitude research plane filming us as we re-entered. I mean, th this was only the third time uh, a Dragon capsule has re-entered the atmosphere uh, since this program began, since the space shuttle retired, or at least a Crew Dragon. There's still an awful lot to learn. In terms of on orbit, you know, we were at an altitude subjecting us to a radiation profile that we haven't studied since the Apollo program. I mean, it's way higher than the space station, which is shielded from our atmosphere to some extent. So if we're going to go to the moon and Mars and beyond, we got a lot to learn. I mean, we, we had the equivalent of a chest CT scan uh, on orbit for three days. Well, imagine going to Mars over six month duration and back. That's hundreds of CT scans. That'll kill you if we don't learn how to deal with it. So we were doing all sorts of research and science experiments over those three days. And the, and the data is now with the labs. I'm really looking forward to the results. Jared, I have to ask you about cryptocurrencies, given what we're seeing in the market. The first minted digital NFT track up in space. Shift4 Payments has said it's going to invest and partner more actively in cryptocurrencies. Where do you stand on cryptocurrencies uh, as a currency in transactions, things of that nature? Well, we were certainly happy to bring that Kings of Leon NFT up to orbit um, to help raise funds for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. So in that respect, I'm 100% a supporter. And I think the blockchain is really interesting. I, I think we are a ways away from crypto being a mainstream form of currency. And I say that as a, you know, the CEO of a payments company that powers about 200 billion a year in commerce. Um, you know, we're, I don't think we're there yet. It's, it's just too volatile. Um, but, you know, we're not ignoring it either. So we are making investments in it to make sure that, you know, 
consumers are able to do business with um, with our merchants, um, you know, the way they like. And, and that's probably going to be an alternative payment methods like crypto in the future. Jared, in one word, will you go back up into space? It's got to be more than a word, but I would say if it if there's a mission that can have a real meaningful impact on the world, um, then, then I'd be there. All right, Shift 4 Payment CEO Jared Isaacman and our very own Ed Ludlow there back from a historic trip. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Stay tuned to Bloomberg Television Wall Street Week coming up next with my colleague David Weston. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg. Thank you.